You are looking at football history. Make no mistake, this is a massively significant place in terms of football history and in understanding the modern game of association football in the form we have today. Over many decades, in the early 1800s, Cambridge students used the open spaces of Parker's Peace as football's early research laboratory. Students who had come from different public schools came here during their social time while at the university. And with them came their various ideas about how to play a team field game with a ball. These same students tried things out, rejected some ideas, but embraced others. From this experimentation emerged a set of footballing principles, rules if you like, that some students, largely led by students from key public schools and colleges, emerged a set of rules that they preferred. Those principles, rules, did go on to have a degree of influence on the development of modern association football. And you cannot deny that the influence did come from this space. You cannot ignore Parker's Peace Cambridge and its importance in any search for the invention of the origins of our beautiful game. Some historians place even more significance on Parker's Peace. They will tell you that Parker's Peace is the place modern football was invented. It's birthplace. Nowhere else needs examination. It's claimed by many high up in the game's authorities that here a student-led football club emerged at least in 1856 or possibly even earlier in 1848. They will tell you that this football club remained in continuous existence right up till today and in its early years turned its footballing principles into a set of written rules it diligently and continuously protected. They say this club regularly updated these rules to improve them. In 1863, when the new forming London Football Association was seeking a set of rules of its own to codify the game across the world, they were so impressed by the Cambridge rules that they, without too much debate, simply adopted them as their own, and with very almost no alterations and no other influences. By that very act, some say Cambridge University, its rules, its football club accredited with inventing the modern game of football. Such significance is given to this view, we find that this Cambridge club is even given Hall of Fame status in our National Football Museum. The now called Just FA calls this university club the oldest in the world and arranges matches and special lunches to celebrate its key birthdays. The good people of Cambridge have even erected a monument to celebrate the birthplace of the earliest club and rules of the modern game. Credible backing, you would think, but is this actually what happened? Is this the true narrative of the invention of the modern game of association football? You know what I'm going to say? Maybe not. So before we go any further, welcome back to the channel. If you are a regular viewer, you may have already seen my 13 part series, which shows why the city of Sheffield in Northern England is the true home of the biggest game on the planet, association football. Just so you know, we have two principles in these videos. We walk and talk usually around historical football locations and take the time to discuss the question of where our modern game came from. What were its true origins and roots? How did what we have today come about? If you want quick snappy answers, then this video is probably not for you. If you stay with us and hear out the arguments, then it may help your understanding and appreciation of how our beloved game came into being a little bit more. So back to the main question posed in this video. Did Cambridge University, its club and its rules invent the modern game of football? The reality is no one place or set of individuals invented modern association football. There were various influences that led up to the actual universal codification of our game, which didn't actually happen in late 1863, but took another 14 years to fully occur in 1877. I aim to show across three parts of this short series that there were actually three key influences on the development of modern association football. Cambridge was certainly one, but not in the way most historians describe. I aim to show that the Cambridge influence is actually much more complex and deeper than historians suggest, and its main legacy comes not from an alleged football club or set of rules, but actually from key individuals who took the game from Parker's Peace and championed its principles elsewhere. One area of the country adopted these footballing principles more so than anywhere else. One town took the Cambridge principles and ideas and developed them into a successful, organised and widely played sport. This town became our second key influencer in our story. 
The final third piece of the puzzle comes from individuals in London who, having witnessed what was happening in the aforementioned northern town, decided it wanted its own thriving football culture with its own common code and principles to grow and develop the game across the metropolis of London. So three key influences. Cambridge individuals, a northern town, which by now you may have guessed is called Sheffield, and the need for common footballing ground in the capital. Let's start with the Cambridge individuals. If you've ever been to a football match at Sheffield Wednesday's Hillsborough Stadium, then you may have noticed that the east side of the ground were the copies. This side of the ground runs along a road, which is called Peniston Road. Peniston Road is the main road leaving Sheffield to the north and west. If you keep going, after about 12 miles, of course, you end up in the small historic market town of Peniston. Peniston is where we find our first key Cambridge footballing influencer, the Reverend Samuel Sunderland. Samuel Sunderland was born in 1806 in Wakefield and educated there at the Queen Elizabeth Grammar School. He was one of two poor boys who in 1825 won a scholarship to attend and study at Clare Hall, later called Clare College, at Cambridge. While at Cambridge, Sunderland, a keen athlete, was exposed to and converted by the university's field sports. We don't know the exact codes he encountered there, but the mid to late 1820s was just before students from rugby school had started to upset things and cause chaos by picking up the ball and running with it. So we can be safe in assuming it was the more Eton-based game of dribbling with feet he witnessed the most often. The headmaster of Queen Elizabeth Grammar School was also the vicar of Peniston and after Sunderland graduated in 1829 he invited him back up north to be the curate of St John's Church in Peniston. Sunderland settled in Peniston. Later he became headmaster of Peniston Grammar School in 1831 and eventually also the vicar of St John's Church. Peniston Grammar School was a free school to all boys of the parish. We know from evidence left in accounts left by ex-pupils of Peniston Grammar School that Sunderland was keen to promote sport among his students. This included a love of Cambridge-inspired football. Football was played by students here on Kirk Flats, right beside the school and church. Kirk Flats was a field that later became the accommodation for school boarders. Sunderland's story and his influence is best documented in this excellent book written by Lavender, Neil and Galliford. This book explains Sunderland's influence on key individuals who then went on to help develop football elsewhere. Three of these key individuals left Peniston as adults and went to seek their futures in nearby Sheffield. These three were John Charles Shaw, John Ness Dransfield and John Marsh. John Shaw was born in 1830 in Peniston and was educated at Peniston Grammar School under Sunderland. We have come across John Shaw before during our series about Sheffield football. Shaw moved to Sheffield in 1853. In 1857, he was a founding influence as a member of the world's oldest and first football club, Sheffield FC. He became their first captain. Most importantly, he was at the club when it was forming its rules, the first written rules by an organised football club. As we saw during our earlier series, these Sheffield rules are remarkably similar to the rules attributed to Cambridge students around the same time. In 1860, Shaw became one of two founders, secretary and captain of the world's second oldest football club, Hallam FC. While at Hallam, he captained the winning team in the world's first ever cup final in 1867 and was the first player in history to lift a football trophy, the Yodan Cup. This Sunderland-influenced Peniston lad also later became founder and later president of the Sheffield Football Association and played in key early football promotional matches such as the first 1866 representative match, Sheffield vs London. Shaw was there at all the key early football developments in Sheffield. Most significantly in 1877, as Sheffield FA president, Shaw oversaw the unification of the Sheffield rules with the London FA rules. 1877 was the actual point in history when a Universal Association Footballing Code was finally created, not 1863. This amalgamated code survives to this day, meaning that even today we play by a combination of FA and Sheffield rules. Yes, a Cambridge graduate-inspired Peniston-born footballer became a key player in this universal codification of the game. 
If you're looking for Cambridge influence on the history of the game, then the link between Sunderland and Shaw provides it. But there's more. Also connected with early Sheffield football development was another Penistone Grammar School, Sunderland educated pupil, John Marsh. He was born in Thurlston near Penistone in 1842. Marsh was also a very early Sheffield FC member and became their second captain after Shaw. Marsh played for Norfolk in the very first ever cup final. Marsh became a founding member and the first captain of the Wednesday and in 1868 lifted the second oldest cup trophy, the Cromwell Cup. The two oldest cup trophies in the world were won by teams captained by ex-pupils of Sunderland and Peniston Grammar School. Marsh also became an influential member of the Sheffield Football Association and captained key Sheffield representative sides against London and Glasgow to promote the game. Marsh later, in 1874, moved back to Filston to set up the first organised club in the area, the Crystal Palace Pub Club, and spread the Sheffield and later amalgamated rules throughout that part of Yorkshire. John Ness Dransfield was born in Peniston in 1839. He was baptised by Sunderland and again was educated under him at Peniston Grammar School. Dransfield became a Sheffield FC member in 1860. He played for Hallam in 1861 and would have been another footballer influencing how Sheffield rules developed, having previously been inspired by Cambridge Clare College graduate Sunderland. We'll probably never know the true extent of Cambridge-educated Samuel Sunderland's footballing influence on the young people of Peniston and its surrounding area, but there were others born during the 1840s who lived locally and went on into the world to do great footballing things. Ben Swift Chambers, for example, was born in Stockmore in 1845 and raised in Shepley, a few miles north of Peniston. Via Methodist training in Sheffield, Chambers moved to Liverpool, where he eventually influenced the creation of two clubs you might have heard of, Everton and Liverpool. Sunderland was vicar and headmaster until his ultimate death in 1855. By this point we do know at least three of his pupils who all honed their footballing skills in Peniston under the guiding hand of Sunderland as their headmaster had been inspired and went on to become key influences in the development of the game in Sheffield during its earliest years. There were others at Sheffield FC who had attended Cambridge in the very earliest days of the club. As you leave Neville's Court in the heart of Trinity College Cambridge and walk up the steps to its library built by Christopher Wren in the late 1600s, then past Tennyson's bust towards Byron's great statue, past all the tourists and the postcards, as you enter the library you pass a painting of a very early Sheffield FC player and member on your left, Henry Jackson. If you need convincing of connections between Sheffield FC and Trinity College Cambridge, then it's staring you in the face full on at the very entrance of the famous space of learning. Newton, among others, studied here. Henry Jackson, born in 1839 as St James's Row, Sheffield, was son of a surgeon at Sheffield Infirmary by the same name. Collegiate school educated under Trinity graduate and school principal William Grigan, he then went to Cheltenham College in 1856 and in February 1858 on to Trinity College, Cambridge. Jackson was certainly a Sheffield SC member in 1859, but we know he was a keen sportsman, cricketer and footballer. He played football at Cheltenham and would have had numerous early Sheffield SC members in his social circle since 31 of the club's initial membership went to collegiate school. For this reason, it's highly likely that his Sheffield FC membership started earlier in 1858 and before he went to Cambridge. To my enormous gratitude, Trinity allowed me as much time as I needed to read Jackson's letters, plus anything else related to him and his life. Being a fellow and vice master, there was a lot. After spending a full day reading someone's personal letters, you really do get a sense of a person. It seems Jackson was extremely well liked and marked for greatness from an early age. There seems to have been very high hopes for him, expressed by those that knew him just prior to him going to Cambridge. There was talk of him becoming a fellow even very early in his Cambridge days. While at collegiate school in Sheffield, he was given responsibilities and later in his educational years trusted to look after younger boys. Even in letters from his friends, you sense a certain deference, so he must have been a very influential young man, even to his contemporaries. They looked up to him. From his friends, there's a lot of evidence that he was a supporting character. Professor Boyd Hilton, who I met while at Trinity, describes Jackson as the stalwart of the fellowship, the life and soul of the party, and his door was always open. 
Many letters reference cricket, but these were written to him during the summer holidays and from places like the Lake District and Cromer. And of course, the summertime is the time when you play cricket. At this stage, football was the winter sport that you played to keep fit. We do know that he played cricket, hockey and football throughout his educational period. An autobiographical account by Parry of his life written just after his death mentions this and most significantly mentions that he was a keen debater of the rules of football. He even sent a copy of the Cheltenham football rules to his brother Arthur when he was aware that Sheffield was involved in discussing the setting up of a London Football Association. Cheltenham played the rude scoring system and Jackson may have been the link in bringing that rule idea to Sheffield. Everything about the man paints a picture of a young enthusiastic Trinity Cambridge graduate who from February 1858 will have been exposed to the Cambridge football rules of that period. I cannot believe he didn't influence and discuss incorporating the Cambridge rules into the emerging Sheffield game during 1858. And this could be a significant reason why the Sheffield rules are so similar to the 1856 Cambridge rules that we are aware of. If we are looking for direct links between Cambridge Trinity College and Sheffield, then I doubt we are going to get any closer than Jackson. As a side note, Jackson's younger brother Percy was also later at Cambridge, so yet another Sheffield-Cambridge connection. His father was educated at Bingley Grammar School under headmaster Richard Hartley of Christ College, Cambridge. So, welcome to Worksop. The small town of Worksop, which has strong historical ties with nearby Sheffield going back to at least 1103, is about 18 miles east of Sheffield and is where you will find our third major trail between Cambridge and its influence on early Sheffield football development. At this point I need to thank all the many people who have helped me in the making of this video by passing on key information. I especially thank Kevin Neal, also mentioned earlier, as well as John Stocks. John is a football historian and author who has studied in depth the links between early works of football and Sheffield. Much of this next Cambridge Sheffield link is thanks to him. In 1847, James Appleton, ex-St John's Cambridge student, became vicar of the ancient Priory Church of Worksop. James was a subscriber to muscular Christianity and so a big promoter of sport being good for the soul, etc. We know Cambridge football was played at St John's. James made sure all his five sons grew up to become keen cricketers and footballers. He sent two of his five sons, John and Charles, to Rossall Public School. At the time, Russell was considered to be the Eton of the North and the school of the fictional Eagle character Dan Dare, apparently. Russell was known to be a centre for sporting excellence of its day. Three England footballers came from Russell. Russell's football rules had their roots in the Eton field game and, like Cambridge, discouraged handling and catching the ball. Both of James's Russell-educated sons excelled at sports. Charles eventually played cricket for both Yorkshire and All England and later moved to Standish Hall near Wigan to help establish Wigan Athletic. The ties between the Appletons and Sheffield FC's founding family, the Creswicks, were strong and long-lasting. Charles married the niece of Sheffield FC's joint founder, Nathaniel Creswick. The families attended each other's weddings well into the 1900s. James Appleton also knew Nathaniel Creswick and both John and Charles played for the Sheffield club. John very early in at least 1858, maybe even late 1857, and Charles a little later in 1860. John played in the second game against Hallam in December 1861 at Hyde Park in Sheffield. And Charles played in the first ever game against Notts County in January 1865, just after they formed in 1864. Yes, sorry Notts County fans, 1864. John and Charles were both articled to Creswick and trained with him as solicitors. These two sons of a Cambridge graduate schooled in Eton and Cambridge type football worked and played football closely with Creswick. Imagine the conversations. In addition, John and Charles's brother, also called James like his father, also attended St John's Cambridge from 1859. So two Appleton family members were at Cambridge during its most important code development periods. Records credit John Appleton as an excellent athlete and very capable footballer. He was noted for his long and combination play. He's actually credited in the first ever record of combination play taking place in the game. Today, I guess we call this passing. So even in early Sheffield matches, there is evidence that passing the ball was evolving as part of the tactics of how to play the game. Passing, by the way, was part of the game in its early periods. Don't believe it was suddenly discovered and revealed to the world by Highlanders at Queen's Park in Glasgow in 1867. 
Last time I checked, passing isn't a rule of the game, it's a tactic, a skill. Some do it better than others. The very early Sheffield FC 1858 members list shows under John Appleton, member Frederick Atkinson. Atkinson attended rugby school, but in 1849 went to Trinity College, Cambridge. In 1856, he became curate of the now Sheffield Cathedral under the Reverend Sale. Sale was yet another early Sheffield FC member. I did research on Atkinson while in the Wren Library at Trinity, but could only find out that he liked the boat club and poetry. I don't know what field sports he played while at Cambridge, but the fact that he was keen to join Sheffield FC of one of its earliest members indicates he most likely played Eton-inspired Cambridge football at some point in his time there. He may have played various codes, of course, coming originally from rugby school. He does, however, need to be mentioned, as he is yet another direct Cambridge-Sheffield mid-1850s sporting link. Interestingly, we forget organised sport did exist at Cambridge even before its football. The Cambridge Boat Club, for example, dates back to 1828. So why did football not become organised in the same way, we might ask? Finally, William Prest, the co-founder of Sheffield FC, had many brothers. One of them was Edward. Edward Prest went to St John's, Cambridge. Importantly, he was there at the same time Fring, also at St John's, and Winton were attempting their first rules codification in 1846. Edward seems to have got his BA in 1847. Edward Prest was not a Sheffield FC club member, but I can't imagine he didn't share his knowledge of football at Cambridge with his footy mad brothers at some point, whatever the footballing rules of the 1840s at Cambridge looked like. During late 1857 and during 1858, it's not difficult to imagine Creswick and Prest discussing football at Cambridge, Cheltenham, Rossall, the various forming rules and influences of the time. Discussing all this with Atkinson, Jackson, the Appletons, Edward Prest and of course John Shaw, and in later years with Marsh, Dransfield and many others. Conversations of different experiences, rule debates, and then discussing the best ways to adapt the rules and ideas to the Sheffield environment, its hills. These conversations must have included Cambridge football, since it's so similar to Sheffield FC's 1858 laws. If you're looking for influence on the early development of the modern organised game, then it most certainly comes from Cambridge University student footballers. If you want to award Hall of Fame status to people from Cambridge and start erecting monuments on Parker's Peace, then look no further than the likes of Sunderland and Jackson. Students who took the Cambridge game elsewhere to places and to people who organised it into a form we are familiar with right up to this day. There were others from Cambridge we haven't had time to mention in this video. The three collegiate school ex-Cambridge principals, for example. But the ones we have focused on, I think, do prove the Cambridge-Sheffield area link and influence was certainly there. Next time, we need to focus on Cambridge University Association Football Club. Do we know when they formed? Were they around to offer any degree of influence on early association football development at all? These questions and more are for part two in our short series, Who Invented Football? Many thanks for watching. If you have a helpful comment, you know what to do. Till next time.